Coming in at number five, we have the Brown Lady of Raynham Hall. Raynham Hall is a country home in Norfolk, England, with it being the seat of the Townsend family for almost 400 years. It is more famously haunted by the Brown Lady, who is said to descend the staircase, with a photo even being snapped and released to the public. The story of the Brown Lady has become one of the most famous hauntings in all of Great Britain, and took on new heights following the release of the image, which was displayed in Country Life magazine. Now, she is dubbed the Brown Lady simply because of the brown brocade dress she is claimed to wear. According to legend, the ghost is said to be that of Lady Dorothy Wapple, the sister of Robert Wapple, who was generally regarded as the first Prime Minister of Great Britain. Although, I've never heard of him. Although I couldn't really name any Prime Ministers other than Tony Blair. There's a reason I live in Canada now. <laughs> she was also the second wife of Charles Townsend, who was known to be incredibly violent. So rumour has it that when Charles Townsend discovered that his wife was having an affair with a man named Lord Wharton, he punished her by locking her in her room in Raynham Hall. She would go on to die in Raynham Hall from smallpox in 1726. Now, ever since the release of the photograph of the brown lady, many were quick to call it fake of course, with them accusing the photographer of greasing the lens to create the effect, or even moving down the stairs during an exposure. Sadly though, it does seem to be that the photograph of the brown lady is merely a hoax, with her eerily resembling a standard Virgin Mary statue that's found in a Catholic church. Before we jump into number four, be sure to give this video a big thumbs up, it really helps us out a lot in the YouTube algorithm and pushes our content out more. So if you want more of this and you want more of me, give us a thumbs up. I want more of me. Come in and number four, we have ball lightning. Now, if like me, you had no idea what ball lightning was before coming into this video, well, I shall happily educate you. I was simply just educated. Why did I say simply? That was unnecessary. I was just educated. <laughs> ball lightning is an unexplained phenomenon that has been described as luminescent objects that are typically associated with thunderstorms. They are said to last considerably longer than a flash of lightning. Ball lightning has been depicted in many different ways over the years, with some quite literally depicting it as a round ball of lightning that can fly through the air and strike, resulting in fires or even death. Now, while the cause of the ball lightning is still relatively unclear, many scientists have theorized how they may in fact be created. One explanation, and arguably the best explanation, comes from a team of Brazilian scientists back in 2007, who passed large amounts of electricity through a silicon wafer which ended up creating vapour. Now, when it cooled, the vapour condensed into an aerosol, which proceeded to glow when recombined with oxygen, leading to balls of electricity which were said to have bounced around like tiny little beans. So what scientists can theorise is that ball lightning may very well be created when regular lightning strikes quartz or silica-rich ground, such as sand. This, in turn, creates little balls of lightning. So, you're not entirely safe. Sorry. Coming in at number three, we have the Nazca Lines of Peru. In the Nazca Desert in southern Peru exists something called the Nazca Line, which are very large geoglyphs made in the soil. Originally discovered back in the 1930s, the Nazca Lines are estimated to be around 275 meters across, and made from shallow lines that were dug into the ground. Of course, no one understands how they got there or who made them, with some speculating that they have some religious significance to the Nazca culture. Now, what prompted major debate about the Nazca Lines was how they were in fact created, considering between 500 BCE and 500 CE, planes weren't really a thing. So, how could the Nazca people have seen what they were doing? Now, some, including author Jim Woodman, believe that they could have done this via a hot air balloon, with someone from up above yelling directions down to the diggers below. Woodman even went on to test this theory with a hot air balloon made from materials they would have had back then. The only problem was they couldn't confirm whether the NASCAR people knew what balloons were. And that's a fair point, they probably didn't. However, the mystery may have finally been solved. Wooden stakes were discovered at the site, dating back to the Nazca period, allowing researchers to theorize that the Nazca people at the time may have drawn lines by using long ropes between stakes, which is pretty damn cool if you ask me. Coming in at number two, we have spontaneous human combustion. Have you ever been so enraged by something that's happened to you that you start to get hot? You feel like if you were to get any more angry, you might burst. 
or even burst into flames. Well, according to some reports, this has happened to people. Spontaneous human combustion was first referenced in the 1600s and described the concept of the combustion of a living human body without an apparent external source of ignition, aka people just bursting into flames without any fire or match nearby. Now, this is merely a phenomenon. However, cases of human combustion have been reported, as well as it appearing in literature. There ended up being enough reports of these random combustion cases that people were forced to further investigate. And of course, it turned out that some of these claims were wildly exaggerated. I mean, as we know, the human body is made up of mostly water, making it near impossible for us to actually burst into flames. Not to mention any pictures of these incidents that surfaced showed the victim near a source of heat or flame. In most cases, a fireplace. Other theories as to why these combustion cases took place were clothing catching on fire or being accidentally set on fire. There is, for the most part, a rhyme and reason for everything in life, including this. So don't fret, you won't be spontaneously bursting into flames anytime soon. And finally, coming in at number one, we have the face on Mars. Back on August 20th of 1975, something bizarre was discovered on the surface of Mars that had baffled folk for years. On that day, NASA launched its Viking 1 spacecraft, with the ultimate goal being to find out if there was, in fact, life on Mars. During this time, the craft circled the planet, snapping hundreds of photos of possible landing sites for its sister ship, Viking 2. However, during the picture process, something unsettling was discovered, a shadowy likeness of a human face, estimated to be nearly two miles from top to bottom. It seemed to resemble a giant head staring back at the spacecraft. Since NASA released the pictures to the world, the face has since become a pop icon, with it appearing in Hollywood films, books, magazines, and even talk shows. Many folks out there, of course, took this as confirmation that there was, in fact, life on Mars. Meanwhile, others believed there was some kind of ancient civilization on Mars. However, I hate to break it to the theorists who believe something extraterrestrial was at play here, but back in the 90s, when a camera crew for NASA flew across the planet, the team snapped thousands of pictures, once again with people anxiously waiting to find out if the formation was in fact a human head or something else. How the face on Mars was instead just a hill that looks like a face depending on the angle. Coming in at number five, we have the Umbrella Man. Now, this is a crazy mystery that I actually had no idea about until today. Well, yesterday when I wrote the script. But if you're familiar with the Umbrella Man, you may know exactly what I'm about to talk about. As we know, on Friday, November 22nd, 1963, President John F. Kennedy was assassinated while riding in his presidential car in Dallas, Texas. He was shot in the head, with the shooter being former US Marine Lee Harvey Oswald, who was firing from a nearby building. During the terrible incident, footage and pictures were captured, which have since become incredibly famous, with one picture capturing what has been dubbed the Umbrella Man. He is a blurry figure that is seen in some of the photographs from that day, with him raising a black umbrella despite the weather being clear and the sky being very, very blue. <laughs> Now, after the pictures were released, many threw around the idea that this man was somehow involved in the incident. Perhaps he was even signaling to the sniper when to shoot, whereas others speculated he might have been the shooter himself, firing a poison dart gun which was hidden inside of his umbrella. However, when the case was reopened, a 53-year-old man by the name of Louis Stephen Witt came forward, claiming to be the umbrella man. Explaining that he was not a fan of JFK's father, whom he faulted for supporting British PM Neville Chamberlain's policies towards Hitler. His trademark was of course his umbrella, so Witt chose to carry with him an umbrella that day, with police even examining it themselves, with no weapon being concealed. Coming in at number four, we have how were the pyramids built? The Egyptian pyramids and their construction has been a long debated topic over the years, with many creating theories as to what actually went down and how these wonders of the world were constructed. Back in the 60s and 70s, many were discussing the idea that maybe the Big Bang didn't kickstart the universe, but instead some kind of extraterrestrial life force. Many pointed to the pyramids as clear evidence of this being fact. Many folks believed that ancient Egyptians couldn't have possibly moved around stone blocks of that size with just brute force and muscle, with some suggesting that alien technology was at play here. However, in 2014, this point was disproved by folks at the University of Amsterdam. After analyzing an ancient tomb drawing, it was discovered that Egyptian 
construction workers were able to haul giant stones onto a sled, with water being poured onto the sand in order to reduce friction, and making it easier to drag the stone blocks. Other Egyptian researchers have also thrown around the idea that ancient Egyptians may have used clay as a lubricant in order to maneuver the giant rocks, with around 45 workers making it happen. They could have also used a cradle-like machine to hoist them up. Coming in at number three, we have the Sailing Stones of Death Valley. Also referred to as sliding rocks, walking rocks, or even the rolling stones, these stones are part of the geological phenomenon in which rocks seem to move and leave long trails behind them on the smooth valley floor in Death Valley, on their own accord seemingly. Which is absolutely bizarre, so what exactly causes this? We'll get to that shortly. Since the 40s, people have been baffled as to how these rocks, some as big as 700 pounds, have been moving across the desert floor, with various explanations being tossed around over the years, some including the devil himself, of course he's always around, and some discussing slippery algae. However, after many years we finally got the answers as to how the rocks are moving about on their own. According to scientists, the movement of the rocks occurs over a prolonged period of time. This happens when the area freezes during winter time, creating a thin sheet of ice. When the sun comes out the next day, the ice of course melts, cracking, and then all it takes is a light breeze for the rocks to begin sliding across the panels of ice. However, this doesn't happen quickly, the rocks will only travel a few inches per second. But after a period of time, the movement begins to become noticeable to tourists, with the rocks leaving behind a long trail showcasing their journey. These rocks move more than I do. That's for sure. Coming in at number two, we have the Bermuda Triangle. Now, quite recently, we did a deep dive into the Bermuda Triangle and all the baffling legends and theories surrounding the mysterious location. But do we now perhaps have a reason as to why so much evil occurs in this one hotspot? The Bermuda Triangle is the area between Bermuda, Florida, and Puerto Rico, with the points connecting like a triangle. Now, many strange goings on have taken place inside of this area, with many aircrafts and ships disappearing under strange circumstances. Now, many have been quick to put blame on alien life forms, of course, or supernatural forces, or more strangely, oceanic flatulence, which is methane gas erupting from ocean sediments. However, the reasoning behind a lot of the bizarre disappearances isn't down to extraterrestrial invaders abducting people, but instead it may be as simple as bad weather. In 1975, a librarian by the name of Lawrence David Kush investigated the triangle and its many disappearances, with it becoming quite clear that when aircrafts and ships vanished, bad weather always seemed to be present, with some wreckage even being discovered. On top of that, the US Coast Guard's website stated, I quote, We do not recognize the existence of the so-called Bermuda Triangle as a geographic area of specific hazard to ships or planes. Truth be told, the area is incredibly busy for oceanic traffic. It's just lost a few of the years due to treacherous waters and bad storms. And finally, coming in at number one, we have the Franklin Expedition. Now, many will be familiar with the story of the Franklin Expedition thanks to the novel and television series, The Terror. But what is the truth? What exactly occurred in the Arctic? In 1845, Captain Sir John Franklin departed from England with two ships, HMS Erebus and HMS Terror, with himself and the crew of around 128 men set to explore the Northwest Passage in the Canadian Arctic with a three-year supply of food. However, crew never returned with information about the passage. They instead vanished into thin air, seemingly, with more than 30 expeditions searching for them. However, when the death toll of the searchers began to exceed that of the original crew, the hunt was halted. However, in 1859, remains were discovered along with a log that stopped in April of 1848. It turns out that the two ships became icebound in the Victoria Strait near King William Island, which is of course now known as Nunavut. The crew were stranded for around a year before the crew abandoned the ships. At this point though, nearly two dozen crew members had died. The survivors were led by Franklin and Francis Crozier, with them heading for the Canadian mainland. However, they disappeared for good. Now, depending on what you read or stories you've heard, you may believe that cannibalism came into play here, and perhaps it did. You may have also heard of Arctic monsters, which is of course what was depicted in the novel. However, the explorers succumbed not to cold or even cannibalism, but instead to disease 
diseases such as tuberculosis, with it being speculated that they became weakened by food poisoning. In 2014, the mystery was still being solved, with a Canadian robotic submarine discovering the wreckage of one of Franklin's ships under the Arctic ice, which was absolutely insane. In at five, Jigsaw's master plan. At the end of Saw 3, John Kramer, aka Jigsaw, died, which left fans wondering where the franchise would go from there. Well, we got our answer as it was revealed that Jigsaw had a handful of protégés who continued his legacy. However, the biggest question of all was how the films all tied together, aside from Jigsaw's presence in the film. YouTuber Toberoon took to the internet to give his take on the franchise and what was actually going on. Back in 2009, the YouTuber uploaded a video which detailed his theory that Lawrence Gordon from the first Saw film became the apprentice of Jigsaw, with evidence to back his claims up. As we know, traps require a lot of setup time in order to hide keys or objects before the captives awake. Lawrence was of course a surgeon, and one particular trap involved a man having to cut his eye open to pull a key out from inside. So who better to place the key there than a surgeon? And Toberoon was correct with his assumption, predicting the twist all the way back in 2009. Props. Coming in at number 4. The Simpsons Once Donald Trump became president back in 2016, many Simpsons fans started to notice a trend. A trend that involved the Simpsons predicting the future, including Trump's presidency, which has led to speculation that the show has insider knowledge on the future events of the world. However, one YouTuber, All Time Conspiracies, compiled all the evidence and brought the theory to life on the streaming platform. In one episode, The City of New York vs Homer Simpson, Lisa holds up a magazine that shows the price of a bus ticket to New York, just $9. The Empire State on the left and the Twin Towers on the right. However, due to the positioning of the Nine and the Twin Towers, it clearly spells out. 9-11, almost predicting the events that would later unfold. In a flash forward episode of The Simpsons, we see Lisa become president, and is forced to deal with the leftover damage from the previous president. And who was that president? Donald Trump. Chills. In at 3, Time Traveller. Charlie Chaplin's film The Circus was released all the way back in 1928, but made waves just a few years back when viewers picked up on something a little odd in one of the scenes. A woman can be seen walking by holding something to her ear that looks very similar to a cell phone, a device that certainly wasn't around back in the 20s, that's for sure. So of course many flocked to the internet stating that the woman was a time traveller, because of course. YouTuber John's Wacky World was somewhat of a skeptic and took to YouTube to explain what he thought the woman was holding. He believes it to be a hearing aid from circa 1925, which back then was much more bulky than they are now. The same day the video was uploaded, another user, explain.exe, posted to YouTube to theorise that the woman was in fact just holding her hair. I don't know though, what do you guys believe? Let me know down below. In at 2, Medicine Man. 11BX1371, that is the name of a very creepy video that was uploaded to YouTube and seemed to show a man dressed in some sort of Medicine Man style outfit, as bizarre sounds and imagery play throughout the video. Five months prior to this, a YouTuber also posted the video to his account and was surprised to see it garner so many views and comments. He claimed that he had been anonymously sent the video, so folks of course went digging, and found an even earlier version of the video that was posted to a paranormal board on 4chan. Now another YouTuber went even further further, digging into the audio and finding hidden messages in its waveform, such as the words, you are already dead, as well as the face of a screaming woman displayed within the noise of the audio. One person that analysed the footage was YouTuber Rainbot, and during her research she was able to debunk most of the theories surrounding the video, and while looking at the video she discovered that most of the footage was still frames from low budget horror films. Well, there we go. And finally coming in at number 1, Jason Stevens. Back in March 2016, 36 year old Jason Stevens disappeared, and was last seen leaving his job. Police and family hunted for the the missing man, but to no avail. About a year later, YouTuber Matthew Bullado made a video that documented him interviewing random homeless people in LA. Now one individual in particular caught his interest. He dreamt of getting off the streets and getting certified so he could work on luxurious cars. When Matthew left the man and went home to edit his video, he began to notice that the man was familiar to him, and doing some minor detective work concluded that the man was in fact Jason Stevens. So Matthew contacted Jason's old boss, who informed Matthew that Jason had been a very talented worker, which surprised everyone when he just up and left. Matthew wanted to help out Jason's friends and family, so once again Matthew took to the streets of LA and tracked down Jason once again, who explained to the YouTuber that he up and left after an incident at work resulted in a nasty hand injury, leaving him only able to work on a computer. This wasn't what Jason wanted, so he up and left, headed for California to further his career. Kicking off at number 5, 
Paulette Jasta. In May 1979, a 25-year-old woman, Paulette Jasta, had disappeared from a small town in Michigan where she lived with her mother and six siblings after being tormented by her own mental health issues. The family were distraught and searched endlessly for Paulette, but to no avail, left with no explanation as to her ultimate fate. They were left in the dark for nearly 35 years until Sharon Derrick, a forensic anthropologist, was examining old autopsy pictures of an unidentified woman whose body had been buried in a pauper's grave in Houston, Texas. Sometime in January of 2014, Sharon Derrick had received a tip from the internet, a web sleuth who had been scouring a database of unmarked graves and unidentified deaths when they noticed similarities between the Paulette Jester missing persons report. After pursuing the lead, Sharon managed to match photographic evidence of three distinct freckles on the Jane Doe's face to that of Paulette Jaster, which tragically revealed that she'd been killed in a hit and run incident on March 28, 1980. Sadly, Paulette's life had came to an end, but after 35 years, her family could finally grieve their missing daughter. Swinging in at number four, Jalopnik. Here's an interesting one, and of all places, was solved by Jalopnik, which, come on, is a great word. Jalopnik, an automotive fan forum that has a massive user base of motor fanatics who had their moment to shine back in 2012 following a fatal hit and run incident in Waynesboro, Virginia. Tragically, 56 year old Betty Marcel Wheeler was walking near her home when she was hit by a vehicle and killed. The vehicle had fled the scene, but police had found a part of the vehicle lying by the roadside. Unable to identify it, they posted it to Jalopnik, seeking the aid of car enthusiasts in the hope that it would lead to the prosecution of the perpetrators. And guess what? It did. Within minutes of the Waynesboro Police Department asking the internet for help, several users had already came forward and identified the part as belonging to a Ford F-150, which swiftly led to the arrest of two men, bringing justice to Betty Marcel Wheeler and her family. Next up at number three, Grateful Doe. The unsolved mystery of Grateful Doe had perplexed the internet for years. In 1995, a 21 year old man named Michael E. Hager and an unidentified hitchhiker were killed in a car accident in rural Virginia. Hager's family were devastated, but no one mourned for the John Doe hitchhiker as the authorities were unsuccessful in identifying exactly who he was. The only thing to identify him was a tie dyed Grateful Dead t shirt, eventually, giving him the nickname Grateful Doe. The case went cold. Almost 20 years later, a Redditor named Layla Betts from Queensland, Australia stumbled upon the case of Grateful Doe, using a photographic reconstruction of his face from the National Centre for Missing and Exploited Children. Slowly, with the help of fellow internet sleuths, Layla began piecing together Grateful Doe's identity, which eventually led her to being contacted by a guy named Steve, claiming to be the former roommate of the unknown man. Turned out, he was right, and his real identity was Jason Callahan from Illinois, who had gone missing after following his favourite band, The Grateful Dead, on their nationwide tour. For over 20 years, Grateful Doe had remained unknown, but thanks to the hard working curiosity of the internet, he was finally laid to rest. Coming in at number two, Abraham Shakespeare. Now, it sounds like great news winning the lottery, right? But you'd be surprised the lengths that people will go to when faced with the green eyed monster, as is the case of Abraham Shakespeare, a 47 year old Florida man that won $30 million on the lottery and would ultimately end up murdered and buried in a shallow grave. After collecting his winnings and paying off his family's mortgage, Abraham was approached by a woman named Doris Dee Dee Moore, claiming to be a financial advisor with the intention of helping Abraham manage his newfound wealth. Well, her real intention was to take the money for herself, and after months of lies and deceit, she shot Abraham twice and buried him under a cement slab. For months, local police suspected Moore as the killer, but didn't have enough evidence to convict her. The case got backlogged for a while and was put under the scrutiny of the Web Sleuths Forum, a site dedicated to amateur e-detectives. Well, it gets crazier because during the Web Sleuths probe, Moore logged onto the forum anonymously, compelled to defend her reputation, but didn't take into account that crucial little thing known as an IP address. Web Sleuths co-owner Trisha Griffin called Moore's bluff and submitted the IP data to the police, which ultimately led to her conviction, where she was sentenced to life in prison. Don't browse the forum like that. No. And finally, our number one spot, the skull in the bucket. 
and this is a bit of a roller coaster to say the least. But the perfect example of what one determined internet detective can pull off with enough time on their hands. Back in 2001, a retired trucker named Roland Telfer noticed something weird at Missouri truck stop an abandoned plastic bucket filled with concrete. Thinking to use it to feed his pigs back home, he dumped the concrete on his farm. But it wasn't until months later, when the concrete had crumbled away, that he realized what it really was. A human head. Eventually, it turned out that it was the head of Gregory May, a 56 year old tattoo artist that was murdered in 2001 by his best friend Douglas De Bruyne over May's incredibly rare Civil War memorabilia. What followed was a tragic, intricate tale of murder, but De Bruyne couldn't be tried for one simple reason. At the time, the skull wasn't verified to a person, and without a body, De Bruyne couldn't be connected to the murder. Now, enter Ellen Leach, an amateur internet salute who went to arduous lengths in connecting the skull to that of Gregory May. And a eventually provided enough evidence to tie the two together, resulting in the conviction and life imprisonment of his killer. Great job, Ellen. <laughs>